chapter, and we're talking about Dan. We're talking about Dan. Dan is going to be a very interesting study. Um, and so we'll just jump right into it. Dan, uh, Genesis, the 49th chapter, starting at the 16th verse. Genesis, the 49th chapter, starting at the 16th verse, it reads as follows. It says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Verse 17, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. And here's something that's um, a little unusual. Verse 18, it says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. And so uh, we see here in this uh, pronouncement by Jacob as it relates to Dan, he talks about how Dan, or at least the descendants of Dan, shall judge the people as one of the tribes of Israel. Then Dan is described as a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heel so that the rider falleth backwards. And so that's, that's an interesting statement there in verse 17. We'll have to do a little more research to understand what that is actually referring to. Um, keeping your place there, we always like to turn to the book of Deuteronomy and compare um, Jacob's blessings with the blessings that Moses gave to the tribes of Israel. And in Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter, which would be towards your right, right before Joshua, um, 33rd chapter and the 22nd verse of Deuteronomy, it says the following, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp, he shall leap from Bashan. And here, um, Dan is described as a lion's whelp, a whelp is any type of uh, uh, pup or young animal. It could be not just in reference to a wild animal like a bear or a lion, like a bear cub or a lion cub. It could even be in reference to a domesticated animal like a dog. A dog, the puppy could be referred to as the whelp of the, of the dog. So it's referring to um, um, a, young, a young animal or, or a young creature, in this case a lion's cub. And so that's sort of indicating uh, just a tad bit of immaturity somewhere because Dan is not described as a lion. He is described as a lion's whelp, all right? So there, uh, this may be giving some connotation that uh, Dan, he's, he's kind of strong, but then there's going to be some immaturity somewhere along the way. And if you think about the story of Samson, we know that Samson was a judge out of the tribe of Dan, according to, I think it was Judges, the 13th chapter, where it starts talking about uh, Samson and how he came out of the tribe of Dan. Samson did a lot of great works for the Lord, but Samson, if you read the stories uh, about Samson, he also was, at some point, he, he made some very poor decisions. And so he showed some signs of immaturity as well. And that may tie back into Mo the pronouncement that Moses made. Going back to Genesis 49, 16, saying Dan shall judge his people, we know that at least one judge came out of the tribe of Dan, and that was Samson, all right? Now, what's interesting about Dan that we'll find out today is that if you look at these maps, if you look at these maps, we have Dan that starts out here on the, I guess it's the west of the country of Israel on the coast here. We see that? Mm -hmm. All right. And we have Dan here as part of the land that was uh, allocated to Dan. All right. But then it's interesting that during the time of the, of the kings, where is Dan? <laughs> Dan pops up here, and you say, well, wait a minute, how did that happen? I thought Dan was down there. Well, both of these maps are really correct, because Dan started in the lower part of Israel, but then the tribe of Dan relocated to the north, all right? And we'll learn more about what exactly happened in that situation. But <laughs> Dan was, was a unique tribe in that when they were allocated certain land, that they just didn't stay in that land. They said, hey, we, we need something else. And so they kind of moved around a little bit. And that's why you'll find Dan 
in some maps, you can look in your Bible, you'll find some maps that will show Dan here, and then other maps that will show Dan here, where those maps are both correct depending upon the time in which those maps were trying to represent. Does that make sense? Okay. Another thing to, that's interesting too uh, is that, and I'll try to maybe see if I can bring pictures or something for next time. Dan uh, also represents the peninsula that we talked about um, when um, we had an opportunity to visit Israel. And I told you that there was a little peninsula, a little spot here. We were up on a mountain. We were in the land of Dan. And that if you look to your left, you can see over into the country of Lebanon. We saw the Hezbollah camps over in Lebanon. If you look straight, you can see into Syria, which is Damascus, the Damascus Road, where, where, where Paul had his Damascus Road experience. And then if you look to the right, you can see the country of Jordan. So it's pretty interesting that from there's a mountaintop here in Dan that you can stand on that mountaintop and you can see three different countries from that standpoint while standing in a fourth country. So I, I thought that was kind of neat, uh, neat experience to be able to see that. But that happened in the uh, newly relocated area of Dan. Let's get a little background on Dan and figure out where Dan came from. Um, go back to Genesis, the 30th chapter. Genesis, the 30th chapter. <clears throat> and we'll try to figure out where Dan came from. Now, uh, in Genesis, the 30th chapter, this is around the time, of course, that uh, Jacob, we know Jacob had two wives, and, he had, and his wives had two handmaids, right? Um, in the previous chapter, Genesis 29, Jacob's first wife, Leah, had at least four children, all right? And in the latter part of Genesis, the 29th chapter, it talks about how Leah had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, those four children. Rachel, the second wife, didn't have any, any children. So let's just, just briefly talk about how Dan came to, to be for a moment. In uh, Genesis, the 30th chapter, we'll start at verse 1. And it says, And when Rachel saw that she was bare that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister, this time about Leah, and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in God's stead, am, am I in God's stead, who hath withheld thee from the fruit of the womb? Okay, now this is a very desperate situation for, for Rachel, and it even got Jacob um, upset. Rachel was childless, and she, she wanted to have a child, um, but she was being a little unreasonable to a certain extent because she told Jacob, she said, hey, give me some children or I'm going to die. I just can't take it anymore. And so there was a little tiff between Jacob and Rachel because of that. Now, J uh, Rachel had a plan. Let's see what happens here in verse 3. She said, and she said, behold, my maid Bilhah, Go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. Verse 4, and she gave him, Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. Now, that's pretty interesting. Now, was that really a, an original idea? Had anyone else ever tried that in the scripture where they felt that they couldn't have children, so they said, well, I'm going to let this woman be a substitute? Have we heard of that happening anywhere else? Hmm? It was Abraham and Sarah, right? Yeah, right? Uh, Sarah at the time was unable to have children, and so she gave of her handmaid Haggai to Abraham, and Abraham had a son by Haggai whose name was Ishmael, okay? But God let it be known right away that wasn't part of the plan. It's been trouble ever since. <laughs> and Ishmael's been around. The descendants of Ishmael have been around Israel ever since, poking and causing problems for the children of Israel, all right, but that, that's another uh, Sunday school lesson within itself. But um, there is such a thing as God's blessed will versus God's permissive will, all right? God will let people get away with certain things, but just because he lets you get away with it doesn't mean that it was his blessed will that he just signed off on it, all right? He allows, God allows things to happen, but just because he allows things to happen doesn't mean that he necessarily approves of it, okay? He, you know, he gives, and I don't want this to come off the, uh, uh, in a 
blasphemous or a bad way, but he gives the bank robber the strength that he needs to rob a bank, if, if I can say that. You know what I'm saying? But that doesn't necessarily mean that he approved of that man robbing a bank. The, it, okay? Can I... Y'all understand what I'm saying there? I'm not trying to say he approves of bad stuff, but I'm saying God allows things to, 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 to happen. Um, and so we see right here that Jacob, he had a dispute with Rachel, but for whatever reason, he didn't rebuke Rachel when it came to Bilhah for some reason. He was like, okay. <laughs> he kind of went along with it uh, instead of rebuking her and said, no, that's, that's your handmaid. I'm not going to go in unto her, you know, but, you know, that's... Jacob's character, I guess. And, and he went into her, and it says in verse 5, it says, And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. Now, in verse 6, this is where we learn about uh, Dan. Because in verse 6, it says what? It says, and, and Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. All right? Dan is the firstborn of for lack of a better word, a, a handmaid or, or a bondswoman. And then there would be others to come because after Dan, um, Bilhah would bear another child and his name would be Naphtali. And we talked about Naphtali in a previous Sunday school lesson already. So he was the second child born of a handmaid. And then Leah got into the act. She said, oh, well, if <laughs> Rachel can do it, I can do it too. And she gave him her handmaid. And then I believe that's where Gad and Asher came from. All right. Okay. Why couldn't she just have her own kids? She Who, Rachel? Did. No, 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 no. Leah? Yeah. Oh, because the, script, the scripture tells us that Leah had left from bearing. All right. She had already had four children. Um, but um, in verse 9 of chapter 30, it says, When Leah saw that she had left from bearing, which meant that she saw that she was not able to have any more children at that time, then what did she do? She says, well, I'm going to give Zilpah to, uh, because these two women were in competition, right? They were in competition for Jacob's affection. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, and, and Jacob. I can't handle manipulation. Jacob was having a good time. Yeah, J Jacob didn't put up a fight. You notice that? And, 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 and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Sound like he had a bird going. Jacob, Jacob rebuked Rachel in verse 2, but then as far as everything else that was going on, he seemed like he didn't have a problem with it. He went along with it, all right? Now, here, here's the thing that when we look at verse 6, you may say to yourself, well, just like last week we talked about uh, how Issachar was an answer to Leah's prayer because Issachar was the child that was born of Leah when she had left barren, right? Well, there was two, Issachar and Zebulon. Uh, when she thought she couldn't bear any more children anymore, God hearkened unto her. The scripture tells us that God hearkened unto her, and then that's where Issachar came from. She started having children again. So she had a total of seven, if you include Dinah, who was the, the girl, the daughter, the last one. She had a total of seven. But <laughs> if you look at verse 6, Rachel said, that God heard her voice. It doesn't, notice the scripture doesn't say that God heard her voice. It says Rachel said God heard her voice. Y'all notice that? And saying that's the difference. And, that, and then when you read scripture, you have to read it from the standpoint of is the narrator telling the story or is the person in the scripture describing what's going on? Because that can make a difference. And the reason I say that is because I do not believe at this juncture that God was answering Rachel's prayer. I believe God allowed Rachel to do the devious thing that she did to have this surrogate mother and to have children by this other woman, you know. But I do not believe that God necessarily blessed that situation. Now, did he bless the offspring? Did he bless Dan and Nathalie and the rest? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, the children of the handmaids from both Leah and Rachel, their children had 100% full rights and inheritance, just like the other children who were born of the, of the wives, which is very unusual because normally that's not the case. Normally if you're the child of a bondswoman or something of that nature, you have, or a concubine, you have a lesser status. But these 
men that were born to these handmaids, they had, uh, you know, just as much right to the land of Israel as everyone else did. All right. So the handmaid's children are actually, were actually the wives' children, and so they had two mothers. They called technically. Technically, I mean technically, yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. It's, I mean, like because Rachel uh, says. She had a son and she named him that. So. Right. Oh, you're talking about for the handmaids. She right. took the handmaids. Basically, Rachel took the handmaids' children as her and called them her own children, yes. Right, yeah. And Leah, Leah did the same. But biologically speaking, they were the, the children of someone else. As though they were stepchildren. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's how they were able to inherit right, the, right. the land. Well, you know, that's a good point. I, 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 didn't, I didn't think about that because Rachel and Leah, for lack of a better word, sort of adopted those children. Then even by adoption, you have just as much right as the, as the, blood, uh, as the blood, you know, children who were born biologically. So from that standpoint, yeah, I could see why they would have full rights. Because I did think it was very unusual for the child of a, of a bondswoman to have those full rights, you know. But that wasn't the case with with Ishmael, though. (laughs) Because, and the reason why, you know, you have to keep in mind, Sarah, at some point, she got to the point where she was, she rejected and envied uh, Haggai and, and her son. And she was the one that requested that they be cast out of Abraham's presence. So now it's her son because at the time, it was Sarah's son because she gave her, his, her handmaid to Abraham. She was she claimed Ishmael. She was going to claim Ishmael as her own, but later on she rejected Haggai and Ishmael. And Abraham didn't know what to do. He talked to the Lord about it, and the Lord said, "It's okay. They need to be put away from the camp. You need to honor your wife's wishes," which once again speaks to the character of God, where. God's always going to take the stand with the man and the woman who are husband and wife versus someone who's outside of that relationship. But if, that, if she <clears throat> said that was her child, she, and then all of a sudden it was not her child, that she <laughs> yeah, she changed her mind. You take one, you know, it's just yeah, hard to understand. Yeah. Because, Miss, yes? I don't handle manipulation or moodiness. I don't, I don't understand how he can be so merciful. Yeah, yeah, he's a very merciful God. And, stupid things, don't and, and, and the story of Abraham and, and Sarah and Haggai and Ishmael, that would probably require its own separate Sunday school study. I'm sort of glancing over that study. I was just using it as an example to demonstrate that this was not something new, that you know, these people had come up with, all right? So, but what I did want to emphasize, though, was that uh, Rachel perceived that God had answered her prayer when I don't believe that was necessarily the case. I believe God allowed what happened to happen, but I don't believe God was really in the middle of it because it's Rachel who says God heard her prayer and not the narrator of Genesis, who we believe to be Moses, Uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God who wrote the book of Genesis, the narrator is not describing that. Now the narrator describes, if you look at verse 30, and we have to move on, um, in chapter 30, if you look at verse um, 22, it says, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Now, if you look back there in verse 22, who's talking? The narrator, the, the narrator of, the, of Genesis, who is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. So these, this is the word of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we believe what that says because it says God hearkened. It doesn't say Rachel said or Jacob said or somebody else said. It says God hearkened. So we could take that as a cold heart fact that God really did hearken to her prayer or her request at that point where Joseph was born. So Does that make sense? So in 24, so the Lord 
She said she was going to have another son. The Lord didn't say anything at that point. <laughs> That's what she said. You see, once again, it goes back to what she said versus what the narrator said, all right? And that's not to say that every character in Scripture uh, can't say something that's true, but when we read it, we just have to understand the context, all right? Okay, and so I just wanted to make that distinction because I believe that's important to know that in verse 6 of chapter 30, that was something that Rachel said and not something that God said as it relates to Dan, all right? Is that okay? All right. Okay. Let's move on. There's a lot to cover about Dan, and we're going to have about five minutes here. So I want us to turn to the book of Judges. You got Joshua after Deuteronomy, then you got Judges. And turn to the 18th chapter, and we'll want you to read the entire 18th chapter, probably the Genesis, I mean, I'm sorry, Judges, the 17th chapter and the 18th chapter for next Sunday, just so to give you some background, those two chapters, Judges 17 and 18. But Judges 18 talks a little more about the tribe of Dan. So we may not necessarily learn a lot about Dan the person because there's not a lot in scripture about Dan the person, but we can learn something about the attitude and the spiritual maturity of the tribe of Dan. And we can learn some lessons from that. In Judges, the 18th chapter, we're going to learn how Dan wound up going from down here on the west coast up here to the northern peninsula. That's what we're going to learn out of Judges, the the 18th chapter. And we're also going to learn, was that God's will? Or was it their will? Which makes a difference, all right? There are so many people who will do something or they will experience something and then they'll try to uh, um, tie it to God when God had nothing to do with it. All right? And so we're going to see if that's one of those examples here. We won't be able to get far, but we'll see how far we can get. Judges, the 18th chapter, are we there? In Judges, the 18th chapter, and this is going to focus on the tribe of Dan, it says, in those days there was no king of Israel. Well, we know that if you studied the order of the books of the Bible, you know that the book of Judges comes before the, book, uh, the books of 1 Kings, 2 Kings. So the judges, there were judges before there were kings. All right. So it says, in those days the, the tribe of the Danites, which are the tribe of Dan, sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for until that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. Now it's interesting that they say that they were seeking an inheritance, which basically meant they were seeking more land, because they said all the land that they had been given, they didn't have control over it. So what went wrong? What, what's going on there? Well, if you keep your place in Judges, the 18th chapter, but turn back to the very first chapter of Judges, the very first chapter of Judges, <clears throat> the very first chapter of Judges, and if you look at verse 34, the very first chapter of Judges, keep your place in the 18th chapter, the very first chapter of Judges, verse 34, it says, And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. And the, uh, but the Amorites would dwell in the Mount Harris of Agilon and in uh, Shalbim, yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. Okay, so going back to verse 34, why didn't Dan get all the land that they were supposed to have? Because it says right here that the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. But wait a minute, we know from also from the very first chapter of Joshua, God had promised to give the children all of this land, right? Mm-hmm. And he told Joshua, hey, be strong, be of good courage, right? We even got the hymn, What's the, how's the hymn done? I forget now. Be, be strong in the Lord, be of good courage. And that hymn comes from the very first chapter of Joshua, where he's talking to not only Joshua, but to the children of Israel. Now, I believe that God would not have given the people the land if God did not give them the resources and the power to conquer the land. And he also told them to wipe out all the inhabitants, and they didn't do it. And they didn't do it. So I believe that somewhere along the line, there had to have been a lack of faith in the tribe of Dan for them not to subdue the land 
that God had originally given them that they said, well, you know what? It's, it's too tough for us to fight this battle right here. We're going to find some other place to settle. All right? And a lot of times people would do that uh, not only just in regular life, but especially in our spiritual lives. If there's a battle, sometimes it's too hard to, to fight. Sometimes we just throw in the towel and say, oh, well, we're going to try something else. We're going to do something else. All right? Because it's, it's too hard to, to, uh, to go uh, knock on doors and hand out tracts to people. Because uh, even though Jesus said that's the way to do it, that's too hard. I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm, we're going to turn the church into a contemporary church. We're going to dim the lights and have a rock and roll concert and bring people in that way. We're going to try something different. Because that is easier for me to have a rock and roll concert in the church than it is for me to go leave a track on some gospel track on someone's door. All right? A lot of churches nowadays that started out as traditional churches, they're tricking it up. They're doing different things in order to bring people into God's house instead of just sticking to spreading the gospel like Jesus told them to do. Because for them, it's perceived to be too hard. So they're going to try try something different. They're going to do something their own way. And instead of sticking to what God had given them, when God had said, hey, I'm going to give you the resources to conquer the land. You just need to have faith and do what I want you to do. The Nanite said, you know what? This is too hard. The land, if you look in your Bibles, maybe the, the maps, one of the maps in your Bibles, if you have a map, uh, Bible that has maps in the back, you'll see that this area right here was uh, a land called Philistia. And so a lot of times when Samson was fighting, he was fighting against the Philistines because the, the tribe of Dan and the Philistines were in the same area. And so there was constant conflict between the tribe of Dan and the Philistines. Okay, after Samson died, Samson is talked about in Judges 13 through 16, I believe. But after Samson judged Israel for so many years and he died in uh, Judges the 16th chapter, the tribe of Dan obviously decided to throw in the towel, so to speak. That's just a boxing term. It means that they just decided to give up and say, you know what, fighting these Philistines and trying to drive them out is too hard. We're just going to let them have it. We're going to go somewhere else. Does that make sense? Okay. So I believe what's happening right here where they're deciding to travel to someplace else is not necessarily God's will. God will allow them to go somewhere else but I don't think it's God's blessed will. I think it's God's just allowing them to go someplace else because God had told them, hey, this is your land, conquer it. And these people uh, did not uh, truly conquer all of that land and drive out the Canaanites as Brother Preston has already alluded to. All right? So um, it looks like we're out of time. And so what I'd like for us to do is to pick up with the rest of Judges, the 18th chapter for next time. You can read Judges, the 17th chapter and the 18th chapter. The 17th chapter doesn't necessarily deal with the tribe of Dan, but it gives you some background into the people that the tribe of Dan is going to come in contact with. But Judges, the 18th chapter probably talks about more of the attitude, the spiritual maturity of the tribe of Dan more so than any other book in the uh, Old Testament. So that's why i like for us to review that for next time. And we'll see what other lessons we can learn from the, the tribe of Dan because I believe it's, it's a very important lesson uh, for us.